supporting students in literacy, evidence-based resources and recommendations from the What Works Clearinghouse. Welcome to this webinar. After the global COVID-19 pandemic, many students are performing below grade level, and the decline in academic performance has been greater in communities most impacted by the pandemic. So educators need resources that can help them address these challenges. This webinar will present WWC resources with evidence-based recommendations that educators can use to help students improve their literacy skills. These recommendations are available for free in WWC practice guides. Practitioners who have used these strategies will provide insights on how to implement them. Do not miss the companion how done to this webinar, which provides additional tools and videos. In this webinar, you'll hear from educators about WWC resources to support literacy instruction. We will start with a quick overview of the What Works Clearinghouse and its practice guides. Then educators who have used the practice guides will illustrate how you can implement evidence-based recommendations for literacy instruction. The What Works Clearinghouse or WWC was established to be a central and trusted source of scientific evidence for what works in education. The What Works Clearinghouse reviews existing research on educational topics and summarizes the evidence in accessible products. Hundreds of trained and certified reviewers rate whether the studies are of sufficient high quality and then summarize the results from the high quality studies. The goal is to provide educators and other stakeholders with information to make evidence-based informed decisions. The What Works Clearinghouse develops several types of resources. Practice guides provide educators with actionable recommendations on how to apply evidence-based instructional practices and address challenges in their classrooms and schools. Practice guides include examples that are ready to use in your classroom. Intervention reports support schools and districts in selecting evidence-based interventions. These reports summarize all high quality and publicly available research on a specific intervention and discuss the costs and implementation. You can use these reports when deciding, for example, whether to adopt a specific product supplemental math program. Individual study reviews provide the ingredients for practice guides and intervention reports, and they show um, the quality of the study, but findings from one study do not represent all that is known about the effectiveness of an intervention. So these more comprehensive summaries are the intervention reports and the practice guides. In today's webinar, we will focus on six literacy practice guides listed here. For each of these guides, we will briefly discuss the objective of the guide and one of the provided recommendations. Nick Isek will present the first practice guide. Hi, and welcome. I'm Nikki Zetch, and I'm an instructional coach and curriculum resource teacher for the Martin County School District. I'm going to be presenting a recommendation from the foundational skills to support reading for understanding in kindergarten through third grade practice guide. Learning to read is one of the most critical accomplishments in a child's early educational journey. As teachers of these students in these formative years, Teaching them to read is our fundamental mission. Let's go ahead and take a look at the practice guide and see how it can support us through this mission. The foundational skills to support reading for understanding in kindergarten through third grade practice guide is a What Works Clearinghouse or WWC resources that outlines four recommendations. Go ahead and take a minute to scan these four on your screen. Alrighty, the one that we're going to focus on now is recommendation three from the practice guide. Teach students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. When we're teaching students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words, we really want students to orthographically map those sounds to symbols or the graphemes to the phonemes. 
You can implement this strategy by teaching students to blend letter sounds and sound spelling patterns from left to right within a word to produce a recognizable pronunciation. Did you know that although our English language can be tricky with many exceptions to the rules, it's important to note that around 50% of all words in the English language have regular expected sound spellings. And another 36 are regular with only just one little unexpected sound spelling. So that means 86% of words in the English language are fully or highly decodable once that alphabetic code is cracked. This makes the word recognition strand a critical component to our kiddos becoming fluent readers. A logical place we can start decoding and encoding is with simple consonant, vowel, consonant, or CVC words. You want to model that blending first and then provide feedback as the students begin to use this independently. Oh, you know what? A great tool to support this learning in a multi-sensory approach would be the use of Elkonin or sound boxes with counters. Kids love either tapping, touching, or sliding the counters into the boxes as they produce each sound. When you are instructing students to blend by chunking, students produce the first sound on the left followed by the second sound and then those two sounds are combined. They'll combine them before we want them adding the next sound. Students then systematically sweep from left to right, adding each successive sound to the chunk of the word they created before it to then build the complete word. Teachers, you really need to make sure you're giving explicit attention to students' articulatory gestures or the way they orally produce the sounds in the words. This phonemic awareness work is crucial in accurate decoding and encoding. Let's go ahead and try this technique with the CVC word hat located in the panel on the right hand side of our screen. First, you want to make sure you're displaying the word for the students. You can write it on a whiteboard, you can give it to them on a piece of paper, you can have magnet tiles, and the teacher will start out by asking, what's the first sound in this word? Or how does this word start? The student response should be, then ask the student, what is the next sound? The student should follow up with the response of, ah. Then teachers should ask, what sound do you get when you put those two sounds together? We should get the response, ha. Ah. Teacher then continues with, what sound comes next? And the student should reply back, t. Finally, teacher is going to wrap the word up with, what happens when you add ha to and that student's response should be hat. In addition, the practice guide highlights blending by sounding out or the continuous blending technique. Students produce the sound of each individual letter or grapheme representation. They then elongate and connect the sounds as much as possible. For example, let's go ahead and take a look again at the word hat on the right hand side of our screen. After each individual sound is produced by the student, at, the teacher then asks, what happens when you blend the sounds together in order? The student response should be a continuation of the sound such as at, rather than a staccato at. This reinforces the student's ability to hold individual speech sounds in their phonological memory. Teachers can visually support this continuing blending technique by rolling their finger under each sound slowly while sweeping under the word left to right. As your students show progress in learning this skill, they can then apply the strategy to longer words and words that are new to them. We should make sure our kiddos understand how to monitor their pronunciations. They can check by asking themselves if the word they produce when blending the sounds together is familiar to them. Does this make sense? Does it sound right? If it's not familiar or it's a nonsense word, they should be prompted to read the word again to make sure they are blending correctly. Teachers should encourage students to be flexible readers by either trying a different vowel sound or using their knowledge of word parts such as maybe digraphs or blends or affixes when they're reattempting to blend the word. Thanks, Nikki. And now we will hear from Jennifer Bakayoki. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bakayoki, and I'm a State Regional Literacy Director with the Florida Department of Education. 
In my work, I partner with districts to help elevate achievement and improve literacy outcomes for all learners. And therefore, we work hard to ensure that evidence-based practices are in instructional environments. And with that being said, I really need the IES practice guides to help drive my work as they have evidence-based practices and recommendations. So today I'm gonna present a little bit about the improving reading comprehension in kindergarten through third grade practice guide. We all know that reading is a meaning-making endeavor and the ultimate goal anytime we pick up a text is to be able to fluently execute that text with a comprehensive understanding. The Improving Reading Comprehension in Kindergarten through Third Grade Practice Guide can help educators find practices that have been used successfully to teach reading comprehension in the early grades. Here are the five key recommendations highlighted in the Improving Reading Comprehension in Kindergarten through Third Grade Practice Guide. The first one says that we should teach students how to use reading comprehension strategies. The second one says teach students to identify and use a text organization structure to comprehend, learn, and remember content. The third one is to guide students through a focused, high-quality discussion on the meaning of text. Fourth, select text purposefully to support comprehension development. And rounding out the recommendations at number five is establishing an engaging and motivating environment to teach reading comprehension. The first one is highlighted because that's one we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into today. So here's our recommendation spotlight with recommendation one, teaching students how to use reading comprehension strategies. The practice guide actually identifies six strategies and also includes implementation ideas for each one. So how can you implement this recommendation? You can activate prior knowledge and have students use predicting strategies throughout a text, incorporate questioning, visualizing, work on monitoring, clarifying, and fixing up strategies, draw inferences, and work on summarizing. We will highlight two of the six strategies showcased in this practice guide. So visualizing is one of the strategies mentioned in the practice guide. And in this strategy, basically students have to develop a mental image of what's described in the text. A mental image that can help students remember what they read. And this is a really important technique because we make mental models as we read. So to implement this activity, you can model visualization by reading a sentence and then describing what you see, what comes to mind when you read those words. Then through the gradual release model, students can practice by choosing different sections of a text and describing what they read and what they see to their partner before they go off and practice independently. Read alouds offer an incredible opportunity for teachers to explicitly demonstrate and call attention to the cognitive gymnastics it takes to actually make an accurate model of text. Through metacognition strategies, teacher can provide an expert model of how to take specific words on the page and convert them into a visual representation. Teachers can use think alouds, turn and talks, and questioning techniques to make this engaging and bring these words to life for the readers. Many of the other strategies linked to this recommendation can also be elevated as students become increasingly more comfortable with making mental models created from the words in the text. Use your planning time intentionally Take a read aloud and look for words that evoke feelings. Specifically, verbs can be very powerful and linked to feelings. For example, look at what the character is doing. If a character is walking, what word choice did the author use? Did they stomp, stroll, saunter? The word choice can change what we see in our mind when we're lifting words off the page and converting it to a mental image. Another incredibly powerful strategy is the ability to draw inferences. Readers need to draw inferences in order to have a full comprehensive understanding of any text they read. So in this strategy, students have to generate information that is important to constructing meaning, but it might be missing from or not explicitly stated in the text. Because just as we mentioned specific word choice in visualizing, authors do not put every word on the page. So we need to teach students how to look for keywords that help them understand text and demonstrate how those keywords can help us draw inferences. For example, 
as you see on the screen, if a teacher is reading a text and the word clown is mentioned and the word acrobat is mentioned, the teacher can use a think aloud technique to say that she can infer or he can infer that this text is most likely about the circus or takes place in a circus setting. Just as authors are intentional word choice, like we mentioned, they don't put every word on a text. So there are many opportunities for readers to fill gaps. And this is why the ability to inference is such a critical component of comprehension and spotlighted in this IES practice guide. You can watch a short video explaining how to implement the strategies in the link provided on the screen or in the handout. Thanks, Jennifer. And now we will hear from Kim St. Martin. Hello, I am Kim St. Martin, and I'm the director of Michigan's Multi-Tiered System of Support Technical Assistance Center. I will present a recommendation from the Providing Reading Interventions for Students in Grades 4 through 9 Practice Guide. I had the pleasure of being on the panel for this practice guide and by doing so assisted in developing it. For some students, the curriculum resources that are used in the adolescent grades starting at the upper elementary level are written at a higher readability level than they can independently read. In this practice guide, you will find practical recommendations with demonstrated success in improving students' reading performance in grades four through nine. This guide provides four recommendations. The first recommendation is to build students' decoding skills so they can read complex multisyllabic words. The second recommendation is to provide purposeful fluency building activities to help students read effortlessly. Recommendation three is to routinely use a set of comprehension building practices to help students make sense of text. And last, but certainly not least, recommendation four is to provide students with opportunities to practice making sense of stretch text, challenging text that will expose them to complex ideas and information. Let's discuss the first recommendation. So recommendation one is to build students decoding skills so they can read complex multisyllabic words. This practice guide presents examples of how to implement this recommendation. The first step is to identify the level of students' word reading skills and teach vowel and consonant letter sound combinations as needed. The figure on the right-hand side of the slide presents common vowel sound combinations that may be the focus of intervention instruction, depending on the data that's been gathered to identify students' word reading skills. To identify the level of students' word reading skills, you can use a word list reading measure to assist with this. You can group students with similar needs together to focus the intervention instruction. So for example, for students who had difficulty with simple vowel consonant combinations, spend time reteaching common vowel and consonant letter sound combinations. On the other hand, if you have students who have already mastered simple vowel consonant combinations, well, we're gonna teach advanced vowel consonant combinations and vowel teams. Another example of how to implement this recommendation is to teach students a routine they can use to decode multisyllabic words. This practice guide provides two examples of instructional routines that you can use. Choose one routine and teach it to students who need this level of support. Let's go over the two routines. In the first routine, you will teach the students to identify prefixes, suffixes, and vowel combinations to decode the multisyllabic words. You should spend some time reviewing the prefixes and suffixes by, for example, helping students to pronounce them or by explaining their meaning. Model how to implement this strategy a couple of times. So this would be an I do, and then provide some guided practice for students, which would be a we do, then provide students the opportunity to use the strategy on their own. This would be a you do. Let's decode the word unreasonable. First, we would identify prefixes and suffixes. So we would circle un and a bull. Some of your students may know the suffix a bull as the word able. 
So this would be an example of where you may need to help students be able to accurately pronounce the suffix. Second, you would want students to underline vowels. You will use these vowels to identify how to pronounce their sounds and also use them to help students determine the number of syllables or parts that are in the words. Students will learn that each syllable has a vowel, vowel sound, then you will make a loop under each syllable and read each part. Un, re, zun, a bull. Finally, you blend the parts in the word, unreasonable. The second instructional routine is to identify the syllables in the unfamiliar multisyllabic word to then sound it out. The first step of this routine is to underline vowels or vowel consonant combinations. The next step is to count the number of vowel sounds to determine how many syllables are in the word. Then the word is broken into parts using a slash with every syllable having a vowel sound in it. Each part is blended together to read the words. The students will read un, reez, un, a, uh, bull, then blend the sounds to read unreasonable. Thanks, Kim. And now we will hear from Kevin Smith. Hello, I'm Kevin Smith, a former middle and high school English and journalism teacher and current senior research associate at the Florida Center for Reading Research and the RHEL Southeast at Florida State University. I'm looking forward to presenting a recommendation from the Teaching Secondary Students to Write Effectively Practice Guide. This guide provides secondary teachers in all content areas with recommendations that can be implemented in conjunction with existing standards and instructional materials. Teachers can use the guide when planning instruction to support the development of writing skills for students in grades 6, 12, and diverse contexts. This guide has three recommendations that complement one another and can be implemented at the same time. The three recommendations are to explicitly teach appropriate writing strategies using a model, practice, reflect, instructional cycle, to integrate writing and reading to emphasize key writing features, and to use assessments of student writing to inform instruction and feedback. The WWC has another practice guide focusing on effective writing for students in grades K-5. Recommendation one is to explicitly teach appropriate writing strategies using the model, practice, reflect, instructional cycle. Let's start by discussing strategies. Writing strategies are a structured series of actions, mental, physical, or both, that writers undertake to achieve their goals. As noted in the graphic, writing strategies can be used to plan, set goals, draft, evaluate, revise, and edit. To write effectively, students need to implement a writing process involving several components. Because writing is an ongoing process, students can implement these components in a different order, and they may actually implement some of the components at the same time. Strategies help students direct their thinking as writers. It's important to introduce students to different strategies for each component of the writing process so that they understand that there's more than one way to approach each component. Students don't need to memorize all the possible writing strategies and their steps. Instead, they should understand the purpose of writing strategies and know how to select an appropriate strategy for a specific task. The second part of this recommendation is to teach students the model, practice, reflect cycle. A model, practice, reflect approach allows students to observe the thinking and actions of a strong writer, attempt to emulate the features of effective writing, and then evaluate the writing according to those features. By learning from teachers, peer models, and their own written work, students can internalize those features of effective writing and develop effective writing strategies, skills, and knowledge. Writing practice without reflection doesn't provide students with opportunities to internalize those important features of writing or think about how to apply learned skills and strategies effectively in new situations. Teachers should employ the model practice reflect approach during writing instruction and classroom activities, where there's a gradual transitioning responsibility until students are using writing strategies independently. As a teacher, it was very important for me to write in front of and then with my students and have them reflect throughout the process. A teacher providing a detailed think aloud while writing is probably one of the few chances that a student will have to be exposed to what a good writer is doing internally while writing. For practice, I would often write with my students, having them provide the topics, ideas, sentence structures, and vocabulary, and then discussing with them how or even if use and modify the suggestions provided. 
Then we would do a workshop on how to make the pieces fit together into cohesive sentences and paragraphs. A short video with a detailed explanation of this recommendation is available on the WWC website for the elementary students writing practice guide. Now we know that teachers will almost certainly encounter roadblocks to implementing the recommendations of the practice guides. For this reason, the practice guides also include solutions to common roadblocks such as this one. For some students, strategy instruction doesn't seem to improve their writing achievement. In that case, teachers need to consider why specific students aren't benefiting and tailor instruction based on their skill level. For students struggling, strategies can be made simpler by focusing on one step at a time. For advanced students, strategies can be made more complex by adding more steps. Thanks for joining us today. I hope that you find these recommendations helpful. Thanks, Kevin. Now we will hear from Connie Webb. Hello, my name is Connie Webb. I am a state regional literacy director with the Florida Department of Education. Over the course of my career as teacher, interventionist, literacy coach, and now literacy director, I have come to rely on the evidence-based practices that are included in the IES practice guides. Today, I'm going to present a recommendation from the practice guide for teaching academic content and literacy to English learners in elementary and middle school. This practice guide includes four recommendations that educators can implement to support English learners while teaching history, mathematics, science, and other disciplines. Let's take a look at those four recommendations now. One, teach a set of academic vocabulary words intensively across several days using a variety of instructional activities. Next, integrate oral and written English language instruction into content area teaching. Provide regular structured opportunities to develop written language skills. And lastly, provide small group instructional intervention to students struggling in the areas of literacy and English language development. One thing to keep in mind is that the guide focuses on learning in English, as learning academic content in a second language raises issues quite different from learning academic material in one's native language. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at recommendation one, which is to teach a set of academic vocabulary words intensively across several days using a variety of instructional activities. The first step is to choose an informational text. When thinking about choosing a text, think about these things. One, contains a variety of academic words to target for instruction is brief, interesting, and engaging for students? Does the text connect to a given unit of study and build the student's knowledge of a topic? Provide sufficient detail and example for students to be able to comprehend the passage? And does the text contain ideas that can be discussed from a variety of perspectives? Step two is to choose a small set of academic vocabulary words for in-depth instruction. And you should be choosing a list of about five to eight words on which to focus. Our next step is to teach academic vocabulary using multiple modalities, such as writing, speaking, and listening. And then we come to step four. Step four is critical. It is to teach word learning strategies to students that will help them independently figure out the meaning of words. For example, strategies using context clues, word parts and cognates are all highly effective scaffolds for your second language learners. Cognates are words in more than two languages that share a common origin, meaning, spelling, or pronunciation. And these are highly beneficial as a bridge between a student's home language and the English language. If you wanna use cognates, a simple search on Google Translate can help you find any that are relevant to the, your unit of study. For example, if you were doing a unit of study on landforms, you could share a list of Spanish cognates with the class. Desert, desierto, mountain, montaña, and lake, lago. These cognates will help your English language learners, but also help your English speaking students. 
A very useful resource when implementing this recommendation is found on the Professional Learning Community website that's linked here. It has videos that illustrate how to implement the steps. And lastly, some possible roadblocks are also anticipated within the practice guides. And better yet, they include suggestions of how to address these roadblocks. For example, one such challenge could be that teachers are having difficult time finding time to engage in all these steps to teach words deeply. The panel suggests working with other teachers and grade level teams to accomplish the task. And also suggest that administrators arrange times for teams to have common planning. Thanks, Connie. Now we will hear from Stephanie Thorpe. I'm Stephanie Thorpe. I'm an elementary teacher and instructional coach at Seminole County Public Schools. We're going to be looking at um, assisting students struggling with reading, response to intervention, and multi-tier intervention in the primary grades practice guide. This guide has key recommendations for students who are struggling in the area of reading. There are five recommendations. The first one is to screen all students for potential reading problems. We would do this at the beginning of the school year and again in the middle of the school year. Recommendation two is focused on our tier one students. We would want to make sure that time is provided for differentiated reading instruction for all students based on assessments of the student's current reading levels. Recommendations three and four focus on tier two students. Tier two students are students who score below the benchmark score on universal screenings. For our tier two students, we wanna make sure that we are focusing on foundational reading skills in a small group setting, and that small group instruction is intensive and systematic. We also want to monitor the progress of our tier two students at least once a month. This allows us to know whether they are learning the material that we are providing them within that small group instruction, or if they need more support than what we can provide within that small group. And recommendation five focuses on tier three students. Tier three students are students who show minimal progress after reasonable time in tier two small group instruction. Tier three students need daily intensive instruction that promotes the development of the various components of reading proficiency. We really wanna make sure that we're targeting those foundational reading skills with, with our tier three students. The recommendation spotlight focuses on recommendation two, provide time for differentiated reading instruction for all students based on assessments of students' current reading levels. Once again, this focuses on those tier one students. So how can I implement this recommendation? The first thing we can do is provide training for teachers on how to collect and interpret student data on reading efficiently and reliably. When we provide that training and teach the teachers how to collect and interpret student data, they're then able to use that student data to guide their instruction and help the students become more successful. A second recommendation is to develop data-driven decision rules for providing differentiated instruction to students at varied reading proficiency levels for part of the day. When we help teachers develop that differentiated instruction based solely on student data, they're able to help guide their instruction and help the students become more successful. And our third way is to differentiate instruction. This includes varying time, subject area content, and degree of support and scaffolding based on students' assessed skills. The triangle on the right is a tiered triangle. At the very bottom, you'll see that tier one instruction, that's your differentiated core instruction. The majority of your students will be within that tier one group. However, when a student needs more support, they would go up the triangle to tier two. That includes targeted interventions, small group instruction, that intensive systematic instruction that will provide additional supports for our students in need. If the tier two students need additional support, then we would continue up the triangle to tier three. That's the intensive interventions that would be a daily instruction um, that would focus mainly on those foundational skills. Just below the triangle, you'll see a, a link to a short video this video is going to talk in more detail about differentiated instruction and include examples. 
It's also going to share more information about Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. You can also check out the Practice Guide webpage for videos about each of the five recommendations. If you have any questions about the WWC Practice Guides or any other WWC product, you can contact the WWC Help Desk by clicking the link in the screen or emailing contact.wwc at ed.gov. The accompanying handout to this webinar presents links to all the products and resources we have presented today. All related resources are available online at the WWC website.